Part eight of Child Christopher and Goldilyn the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight of the Hosting in Hazeldale. On the morrow early was Jack of the Toffs dight for departure, with Christopher and David and Gilbert and five score of his best men. But when they went out of the porch into the sweet morning, lo! there was Goldilind before them, clad in her green gown, and as fresh and dear as the early day itself. And Jack looked on her and said, And thou, my lady and queen, thou art dight as thou wast when with us. Yea, she said, and why not? What sayest thou, King Christopher? said the captain. Nay, said King Christopher, reddening, it is for thee to yea say or nay say though true it is that I have bidden her farewell for two days' space. The two stood looking on one another. But Jack laughed and said, Well then, so be it, but let us get to the way, or else when the sweethearts of these lads know that we have a woman with us, we shall have them all at our backs. Thereat all laughed who were within earshot, and were merry. So they wended the woodland ways, some afoot, some a horseback, of whom was Jack of the Toffs. But Christopher and David went afoot, and Goldilind rode a fair white horse which the captain had gotten her. As they went, and King Christopher ever by Goldilind's right hand, and were merry and joyous, they too were alone in the woodland way. So Christopher took her hand and kissed it, and said, Sweetling, why didst thou tell me naught of thy will to come along with us? Never had I balked thee, she looked at him, blushing as a rose, and said, Dear friend, I will tell thee, I knew that thou wouldst make our parting piteous sweet this morning, and of that I would not be balked. See then how rich I am, since I have both parted from thee and have thee. And therewith she louted down from her saddle, and they kissed together sweetly, and so thereafter wore the way. So came they to the plain of Hazeldale, which was a wide valley with a middling river winding about it, the wildwood at its back toward the toffs, and in front, downland, naught wooded, save here and there a tree, nigh a homestead or cot, for that way the land was builded for a space. Forsooth it was not easy for the folk thereabouts to live quietly, but if they were friends in some wise to Jack of the Tofts. So when the company of the Tofts came out into the dale about three hours after noon, it was no wonder to them to see men riding and going to and fro, and folk pitching tents and raising booths nigh to the cover of the wood. And when the coming of the toft folk was seen, and the winding of their horns heard, there was many a glad cry raised in answer, and many an horn blown, and all the men there came running together toward where now was stayed Jack of the Tofts, and Christopher and their men. Then Goldilind bade Christopher help her light down, so he took her in his arms, and was not over hasty in setting her down again. But when she stood by him, she looked over the sunny field, darkened by the folk hastening over the greensward, and her eyes glittered, and her cheek flushed, and she said, Lord King, be these some others of thy men? Yea, sweetling, said he, to live and die with me. She looked on him and said softly, Maybe it were an ill wish to wish that I were thou yet if it might be for one hour said he shall it not be for more than one hour shall it not be for ever more since we twain are become one nay she said this is but a word i am but thine handmaid and now i can scarce refrain my body from falling before thy feet he laughed in her face for joy and said abide a while until these men have looked on thee and then shalt thou see how thou wilt be a flame of war in their hearts that none shall withstand. Now were the dale-dwellers all come together in their weapons, and they were glad of their king and his loveling, and stout men were they all, albeit some were old, and some scarce of man's age. So they were ranked and told over, and the tale of them was over six score who had obeyed the war-arrow, and more and more, they said, would come in every hour. But now the captains of them bade the toft folk eat with them, and they yea said the bidding merrily, and word was given, and sacks and baskets brought forth, and barrels to boot, and all men sat down on the greensward, 
and high was the feast and much the merriment on the edge of hazeldale chapter twenty nine tidings come to hazeldale but they had not done their meat and had scarce begun upon their drink ere they saw three men come riding on the spur over the crown of the bent before them these made no stay for aught but rode straight through the ford of the river as men who knew well where it was and came on hastily toward the feasters by the wood edge then would some have run to meet them but jack of the toffs bade them abide till he had heard the tidings whereas they needed not to run to their weapons for all of them they were fully dight for war save it might be the doing on of their sallets or bassnets but jack and christopher alone went forward to meet those men and the foremost of them cried out at once i know thee jack of the toffs i know thee up and arm up and arm for the foemen are upon thee and so choose thee whether thou wilt fight or flee quoth jack laughing i know thee also what of white end and when thou hast told me how many and who be the foemen we will look either to fighting or fleeing said what thou knowest the blazon of the banner which we saw three red wolves running on a silver field yea forsooth said jack tis the baron of brimside that beareth that shield ever and now the baron hight the lord gandolf how many was he said what ten hundreds or more but what say fellows quoth the other twain more more there were said jack of the toffs and when shall he be here deem ye in less than an hour said what he will be on thee with great and small but his riders some of them in lesser space then turned jack about and cried out for david and when he came he said put thy long legs over a good horse and ride straight back to the toffs and gather whatever may bear spear and draw bow and hither with them lad by the nighest road tarry not speak no word be gone so david turned and was presently riding swiftly back through the woodland paths but jack spake to the bearers of tidings good fellows go ye yonder and bid them give you a morsel and a cup and tell all the tidings and this withal that we have naught to flee from a good fightstead for gandalf of brimside therewith he turned to christopher and said thy pardon king but these matters must be seen to straightway now do thou help me array our folk for there is heart enough in them as thee and me and may happen we may make an end to this matter now and here moreover the baron of brimside is a stout carl so fight we must meseemeth then he called to them one of the captains of the toffs and they three spake together heedfully a little and thereafter they fell to work arraying the folk and king christopher did his part therein deftly and swiftly for quick of wit he was and that the more so when so anything was to be done as to the array the main of the folk that were spearmen and billmen but moved forward somewhat from where they had dined to the hanging of the bent so that their foemen would have the hill against them or ever they came on point and edge but the bowmen of whom were now some two hundreds for many men had come in after the first tally were spread abroad on the left hand of the spearmen toward the river where the ground was somewhat broken and bushed with thorn bushes and a bite of the water drew nearer to the tofters amidst of which was a flat ayat edged with willows and covered with firm and sound green sward and was some thirty yards end long and twenty over thwart so there they abode the coming of the foe and it was now hard on five o'clock but christopher went up to goldilind where she stood amidst of the spearmen hand turning over hand and her feet wandering to and fro almost without her will and when he came to her she had much ado to refrain her from falling on his bosom and weeping there but he cried to her gaily now my lady and queen thou shalt see a fair play toward even sooner than we looked for and thine eyes shall follow me if the battle be thronged by this token that amongst all these good men and true i only wear a four-gilded bassnet with a crown about it oh she said if it were but over and thou alive and free i would pay for that i deem if i might by a sojourn in green harbour again what he said 
that i might have to thrust myself into the peril of snatching thee forth again and he laughed merrily nay said he this play must needs begin before it endeth and by saint nicholas i deem that to-day it beginneth well and she put her hands before her face and her shoulders were shaken with sobs alas sweetling said he that my joy should be thy sorrow but i pray thee take not these stout hearts for runaways and oh look look she looked up wondering and timorous but all about her the men sprang up and shouted and tossed up bill and sword and the echo of their cries came back from the bowmen on the left and christopher's sword came rattling out of the scabbard and went gleaming up aloft then words came into the cry of the folk and goldilind heard it that they cried child christopher king christopher then over her head came a sound of flapping and rending as the evening wind beat about the face of the wood and she heard folk cry about her the banner the banner ho for the woodwife of oakenrealm then her eyes cleared for what was aloof above her and she saw a dark mass come spreading down over the bent on the other side of the river and the glittering points and broad gleams of white light amidst of it and noise came from it and she knew that here were come the foemen but she thought to herself that they looked not so many after all and she looked at the great and deft bodies of their folk and their big-headed spears and wide-bladed glaives and bills and strove with her heart and refrained her fear and thrust back the image which had arisen before her of green harbour come back again and she lonely and naked in the least guard chamber and she stood firm and waved her hand to greet the folk and lo there was christopher kneeling before her and kissing her hand and great shouts arising about her of the lady of oakenrealm the lady of Medum, for the lady for the lady chapter thirty of the field that was set in the holm of hazeldale now thither cometh jack of the toffs and spake to christopher see thou lad lord king i should say this looketh not like very present battle for they be stayed half way down the bent and lo thou some half score are coming forth from the throng with a white shield raised aloft do we in likewise for they would talk with us shall we trust them father said christopher trust them we may son said jack gandolf is a violent man and a lifter of other men's goods but i deem not so evil of him as that he would be wraith troth so then they let do a white cloth over a shield and hoist it on a long spear and straightway they gat to horse jack of the toffs and christopher and howard of whiteacre and gilbert and a half score all told and they rode straight down to the ford which was just below the tail of the aot aforesaid and as they went they saw the going of the others who were by now hard on the water side and said jack see now king christopher he who rides first in a surcoat of his arms is even the baron the black bullet headed one and the next to him the redhead is his squire and man oliver marson a stout man but fierce and grim-hearted lo thou they are taking the water but they are making for the aot and not our shore son mine this will mean a hazeled field in the long run but now they will look for us to come to them therein yea now they are a land and have pitched their white shield and hearken that is their horn blow in answer ho oh, noise set thy lips to the brass so then when one horn had done its song the other took it up and men of both hosts knew well that the horns blew but for truce and parley now come the toft folk to the ford and take the water which was very shallow on their side and when they come up unto the aot they find the baron and his folk off their horses and lying on the green grass so they also lighted down and stood and hailed the newcomers then uprose the lord gandalf and greeted the toft folk and said jack of the toffs thou ridest many man to-day nay lord said jack and thou also what is thine errand nay said the baron what is thine as for mine host here there came a bird to brimside and did me to wit that i should be like to need a throng if i came thy way 
and sooth was that come now tell us what is to ord thou rank reaver though i have an inkling thereof for if this were a mere lifting thou wouldst not sit still here amidst thy friends of hazeldale lord said jack of the tofts thou shalt hear mine errand and then give heed to what thou wilt do look to the beds under the wood and tell me dost thou see the blazon of the banner under which be my men that i cannot said the lord gandolf but i have seen the banner of oakenrealm which beareth the woodwoman with loins garlanded with oak leaves look much like to it at such a distance said jack it is not ill guessed yonder banner is the king's banner and beareth on it the woman of oakenrealm the lord bent his brows on him and said forsooth rank reaver i wotted not that thou hast king rolf for thy guest quoth jack of the tofts forsooth lord no such guest as the earl marshal rolf would i have alive in my poor house well jack said the big lord grinning a read me the riddle and then we shall see what is to be done as thou sayest lord said jack dost thou see this young man standing by me yea said the other he's big enough that i may see him better than thy banner if he but make old bones as he's scarce like since he is of thy flock he shall one day make a pretty man he's a gay rider now what else is he quoth jack of the tofts he is my king and thy king and the all folks king and the king of oakenrealm and now hearken mine errand it is to make all folk name him king said the lord this minstrel's tale goes with the song the bird sang to me this morning and therefore am i here thronging to win thy head rank reaver and this young man's head since it may not better be and let the others go free for this time ah what sayest thou and thou youngling tis but the stroke of a sword since thou hast fallen into my hands and not into the hangman's of the kings thou must win them first lord said jack of the tofts therefore what sayest thou where shall we cast down the white shield and uprear the red hot art thou head heart and hand rank reaver said the lord bide a while so he sat silent a little then he said thou seest jack of the tofts that now thou hast thrust the torch into the tow if i go back to king rolf without the heads of you twain i am like to pay for it with mine own therefore hearken if we buckle together in fight presently it is most like that i shall come to my above but thou art so wily and stout that it is not unlike that thou and perchance this luckless youngling may slip through my fingers into the wood and then it will avail me little with the king that i have slain a few score nameless wolfheads so look you here is a fair field hazelled by god let us two use it to-day and fight to the death here and then if thou win me smite off my head and let my men fight it out afterwards as best they may without me and tis like they will be beaten then but if i win thee then i win this youngling withal and bear back both heads to my lord king after i have scattered thy wolf heads and slain as many as i will which shall surely befall if thou be slain first then cried out jack of the tofts hail to thy word stout heart this is well offered and i take it for myself and my lord king here and all that stood by and heard gave a glad sound with their voices and their armour rattled and rang as man turned to man to praise their captains but now spake christopher lord of brimside it is not wondrous that thou set me aside as of no account whereas thou deemest me no king or king's kindred but thou lord earl who wert once jack of the tofts i marvel at thee that thou hast forgotten thy king so soon ye twain shall now wot that this is my quarrel and that none but i shall take this battle upon him thou servant of rolf the traitor and murderer hearken i say that i am king of oakenrealm and the very son of king christopher the old and that will i maintain with my body against every gainsayer thou lord of brimside wilt thou gainsay it then i say thou liest and lo here my glove and he cast it down before the lord again was there good rumour and that from either side of the bystanders but jack of the toff stood up silent and stiff and the baron of brimside laughed and said well swain if thou art weary of life so let it be as for me 
but how sayest thou jack of the toffs art thou content to give thine head away in this fashion whereas thou wottest that i shall presently slay this king of thine said jack the king of oakenrell must rule me as well as others of his liegemen he must fight if he will and be slain if he will then suddenly he fell a laughing and beat his hand on his thigh till the armour rattled again and then he cried out lord gandalf lord gandalf have a care i bid thee where wilt thou please to be buried lord said the other i wot not what thou wilt mean by thy fooling rank reaver but here i take up this youngling's glove and on his head be his fate now as to this battle my will is that we two champions be all alone and afoot on the ayat how say ye even so be it said jack but i say that half a score on each side shall be standing on their own bank to see the play and the rest of the host come no nigher than now we are i yea say it said the baron and now do thou rank reaver go back to thy fellowship and tell them what we have a-reeded and do thou oliver marson do so much for our folk and bid them what this that if any of them break the troth he shall lose naught more than his life for that same therewith all went ashore to either bank save the baron of brimside and christopher and the baron laid him down on the ground and fell to whistling the tune of a merry yule dance but as for christopher he looked on his foeman and deemed he had seldom seen so big and stalwart a man and withal he was of ripe age and had seen some forty winters then he also cast himself down on the grass and fell into a kind of dream as he watched a pair of wagtails that came chirping up from the sandy spit below the ayot till suddenly great shouting broke out first from his own bent and then from the foemen's and christopher knew that the folk on either side had just heard of the battle that was to be on the holm the baron arose at the sound and looked to his own men whence were now coming that half score who were to look on the battle from the bank but christopher stirred not but lay quietly amongst the flowers of the grass till he heard the splash of horse hoofs in the ford and there presently was come jack of the toffs bearing basnet and shield for his lord and he got off his horse and spake to christopher if i may not fight for thee my son and king yet at least it is the right of thine earl to play the squire to thee but a word before thy bastet is over thine ears the man yonder is well nigh a giant for stature and strength yet i think thou mayest deal with him and be none the sorer when thou liest down to-night to be short this is it when thou hast got a stroke in upon him and he falters then give him no time but fly at him in thy wild cat manner and show what like thews thou hast under thy smooth skin now thine helm lad so art thou dight and something tells me thou shalt do it off in victory chapter thirty one the battle on the holm so when christopher was armed jack turned about speedily and so gat him back through the ford and stood there on the bank with the nine other folk of the tofts and by this time was gandalf of brimside armed also and oliver marson who had done his helm on him was gone to his side of the river drew the huge man-at-arms then toward christopher but his sword was yet in the sheath christopher set his point to the earth and abode him and the baron spake lad thou art fair and bold both as i can see it and jack of the tofts is so much an old foe of mine that he is well nigh a friend so what sayest thou if thou wilt yield thee straightway i will have both thine head and the outlaws with me to king rolf but yet on your shoulders and ye two alive haps will go as haps will and it may be that ye shall both live for another battle and grow wiser and may happen abide in the wood with the reavers men ha what sayest thou christopher laughed and said wouldst thou pardon one who is not yet doomed baron and yet thy word is pleasant to us for we see that if we win thee thou shalt be a good liegeman of us now baron sword in fist gandalf drew his sword muttering aha he's lordly and kingly enough yet may this learn him a lesson indeed the blade was huge and brown and ancient and sword and man had looked a very terror save to one great-hearted but christopher said what sayest thou now baron shall we cast down our shields to earth 
for why should we chop into wood and leather the baron cast down his shield and said bold are thy words lad if thy deeds go with them it may be better for thee than for me now keep thee and therewith he leapt forward and swept his huge sword around but christopher swerved speedily and enough so that the blade touched him not and the huge man had overreached himself and ere he had his sword well under sway again christopher had smitten him so sharply on the shoulder that the mails were sundered and the blood ran and withal the baron staggered with the mere weight of the stroke then christopher saw his time and leapt aloft and dealt such a stroke on the side of his head that the baron tottered yet more but now was he taught by those two terrible strokes and he gathered all his heart to him and all the might of his thews and leapt aback and mastered his sword and came on fierce but wary shouting out for brimside and the king christopher cried never a cry but swung his sword well within his sway and the stroke came on gandalf's forearm and brake the mails and wounded him and then as the baron rushed forward the wary lad gat his blade under his foeman's nigh the hilts and he gave it a wise twist and forth flew the ancient iron away from its master gandalf seemed to heed not that he was swordless but gave out a great roar and rushed at christopher to close with him and the well-knit lad gave back before him and turned from side to side and kept the sword-point before gandalf's eyes ever till suddenly as the baron was running his fiercest he made a mighty sweep at his right leg since he had no more to fear his sword and the edge fell so strong and true but but for the burny hose he had smitten the limb asunder and even as it was it made him a grievous wound so that the lord of brimside fell clattering to the earth and christopher bestrode him and cried how sayest thou champion is it enough yea enough and maybe more said the baron wilt thou smite off mine head or what wilt thou said christopher here hath been enough smiting me seemeth save thy lads and ours have a mind to buckle to and lo thou men are running down from the beds towards us from both sides yet not in any warlike manner as yet now baron here cometh thy grim squire that i heard called oliver and if thou wilt keep the troth thou shalt bid him order thy men so that they fall not upon us till the battle be duly pitched then shalt thou be borne home since thou canst not go with no hindrance from us now was oliver come indeed and the other nine with him and on the other side was come jack of the toffs and four others then spake the baron of brimside i may do better than thou biddest me for now i verily trow herein that thou art the son of christopher the old so valiant as thou art and so sad a smiter and withal that thou fearest not to let thy foeman live so hearken all ye and thou specially oliver marson my captain i am now become the man of my lord king christopher and will follow him where so he will and i deem that will presently be to oakenham and the king's seat there now look to it that thou oliver order my men under king christopher's banner till i be healed and then if all be not over i shall come forth myself shield on neck and spear in fist to do battle for my liege lord so help me god and saint james of the water therewith speech failed him and his wit therewith so betwixt them they unarmed him and did him what leached them they might do there and then and he was no wise hurt deadly as for child christopher he had no scratch of steel on him and oliver knelt before him when he had dight his own lord and swore fealty to him then and there and so departed to order the folk of brimside and tell them the tidings and swear them liegemen of king christopher chapter thirty two of goldilind and christopher now jack of the toff said a word to one of his men and he rode straightway up into the field under the wood and spake to three of the captains of the folk and they ranked a hundred of the men of those who were best dight and upraised among them the banner of oakenrealm and led all them down to the river bank and with these must needs go goldilind and when they came down thither christopher and jack were there on the bank to hail them and they raised a great shout when they saw their king and their earl standing there and the shout was given back from the woodside 
and then the men of Brimside took it up, for they had heard the bidding of their lord, and he was now in a pavilion which they had raised for him on the mead, and the leeches were looking to his hurts. And they feared him, but rather loved than hated him, and he was more to them than the king in Oakenrealm, and they were all ready to do his will. But as to Goldilind, her mind it had been, as she was going down the meadow, that she would throw herself upon Christopher's bosom, and love him with glad tears of love. But as she came and stood over against him, she was abashed, and stood still looking on him, and spake no word, and he also was ashamed before all that folk to say the words whereof his heart was full, and longed for the night that they might be alone together. But at last he said, Lady and Queen, thou seest that we be well beloved, that they rejoice so much in a little deed of mine. And still she spake naught, and held hand in hand. But Jack of the Toff spake, and said, By St. Hubert, the deed may be little, though there may be men who would think no little of overcoming the biggest men and the fellest fighter of Oakenrealm, but at least great things shall come thereof. King, thy strokes of this day have won the Oakenrealm, or no man I know in field, and many a mother's son have they saved from death. For look thou yonder over the river, Goldie Lind, my lady, and tell me what thou seest. She turned to him and said, Lord Earl, I see warriors a many. Yea, said Jack, and stout fellows be they for the more part, and hard had been the hand-play had we met ere they had turned their backs. But now, see thou, we shall wend side by side toward Oakenrealm, for our lord there hath won them to his friends, and doubt thou not that when they see him and thee and I, they shall be friends indeed. What, dost thou weep for this, or is it because he hath done the deed and not thou, or rather, because thine heart is full for the love of him? She smiled kindly on Jack, but even therewith she felt two hands laid on her shoulders, and Christopher kissed her without any word. End of part eight. Part nine of Child Christopher and Goldilind the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three. A council of captains. The host comes to Broadleys and makes for Woodwall. That night, though there was some little coming and going between the Tofters and the Brimsiders, yet either flock slept on their own side of the river. Moreover, before the midst of the night cometh David to the woodside, and had with him all men defensible of the Tofts, and the houses thereabout, and most of the women also, many of whom bore spear or bow so that now, by the woodside, what with them of the Tofts, and the folk who joined them thereto from the countryside about Hazeldale, there were well nigh ten hundreds of folk under weapons. And yet more came in the night through, for the tidings of the allegiance of Brimside was spreading full fast. Betimes on the morrow was King Christopher afoot, and he and Jack and David and Gilbert, and they twelve in company, went down to the banner by the water-side, and to them presently came Oliver Marson, and ten other of the captains of Brimside, and did them to wit that the baron were fain if they would come to his pavilion, and hold counsel therein, for that he was not so sick, but he might well speak his mind from where he lay. So thither they went all, with good will, and the baron greeted them friendly, and made what reverence he might to Christopher, and bade him say what was his mind and his will, but Christopher bade them who were his elders in battle to speak, and the baron laughed outright, and said, Me seemeth, Lord King, thou didst grow old yesterday at my costs, but since thou wilt have me to speak, I will even do so, and to make matters the shorter, I will say that I wot well what ye have to do, and that is, to fall upon the Earl Marshal's folk, ere they fall upon us. Now some folk deem we should fare to Brimside, and have a hosting there, but I say nay, whereas it lieth out of the road to Oakenham, and thereby is our road, me seemeth, and it is but some six days riding hence, save, as is most like, two of those days be days of battle, but if we go straight forward with banners displayed, 
each day's faring shall be a day of hosting and gathering for i tell thee lord king the fame of thee has by now gone far in this countryside wherefore i say no more since i wax weary than this to the road this morning and get we so far as broadleys ere nightfall for there we shall get both victual and folk there was good cheer made at his word so christopher spake baron of brimside thou hast spoken my very mind and will and but if these lords and captains gainsay it let us tarry no longer but array all our folk in good order and take tale of them and so for broadleys what say ye lords none nay said it so there was no more talk save as to the ordering of this or the other company and it was so areeded that the brimside men should fare first at the head of the host with the banner of brimside and that then should go the mingled folk of the countryside and lastly the folk of the tofts with the banner of oakenrealm so that if the host came upon foemen they might be for a cloud to hide the intent of their battles a while till they might take their advantage so went the captains to their companies and the tofters and their mates crossed the river to the men of brimside who gave them good cheer when they came amongst them and it was hard to order the host for a while so did the upland folk throng about the king and queen and happy were they who had a full look on goldilind and yet were some so lucky and so bold that they kissed a hand of her and one there was a very tall young man and a goodly who stood there and craved to kiss her cheek and she did not gainsay him and thereafter naught was good to him save an occasion to die for her as for christopher he spake to many and said to them that wheresoever his banner was he at least should be at the forefront when so they came upon unpeace and so soon as they got to the road he went from company to company speaking to many and that so sweetly and friendly that all praised him and said that here forsooth was a king who was all good and nothing bad whereas hitherto men had deemed them lucky indeed if their king were half good and half bad merry then was the road to broadleys and they came there before nightfall and it was a little cheaping town and unwalled and if the folk had any will toward them they lacked might but when they found they were not to be robbed and that it was but the proclaiming of king christopher in the market-place and finding victual and house-room for the host and the mayor taking a paper in payment thereof none stirred against them and many joined the host to fight for the fair young king now naught as yet had they heard at broadleys of any force stirring against them but in the morning when they went on their ways again and were bound for cheaping woodwall which was a fenced town they sent out well horsed riders to espy the road who came back on the spur two hours after noon and did them to wit that there was a host abiding them beneath the walls of woodwall under the banner of walter the white an old warrior and fell fighter but what comfort he might have from them of woodwall they wotted not but they said that the tidings of their coming had gone abroad and many folk were abiding the issue of this battle ere they joined them to either host now on these tidings the captains were of one mind to wit to fare on softly till they came to a defensible place not far from the foemen since they could scarce come to woodwall in good order before nightfall and if they were unfoughten before to push forward to battle in the morning even so did they and made a halt at sunset on a pleasant hill above a river some three miles from woodwall and there they passed the night unmeddled with chapter thirty four battle before woodwall when morning was the captains came to king christopher to counsel but while they were amidst of their talk came the word that the foe was anigh and come close to the river bank whereat was none abashed but to all it seemed wisdom to abide them on the vantage ground so then there was girding of swords and doing on of helms as for ordering of the folk it was already done for all the host was ranked on the bent side with the banner of oaken realm in the midst on its left hand the banner of the tofts and on the right the banner of brimside now when christopher was come to his place he looked down and saw how the foemen were pouring over the river for it was nowhere deep and there were four quite shallow fords many more were they than his folk 
but he deemed that they fared somewhat tumultuously and when the bowmen of the toffs began shooting the foemen a many of them stayed amidst of the river to bend bow in their turn and seemed to think they were nigh enough already nay some went back again to the other bank to shoot thence the surer and the drier and some went yet a little further back on the field so that when their sergeants and riders were come on to the hither bank they lacked about a fifth of all their host and they themselves for all they were so many had some ado to make up their minds to go forward forsooth when they looked up at the bent and saw the three banners of oakenrealm and the toffs and brimside all waving over the same ranks they knew not what to make of it and christopher's host when they saw them hang back break out into mocking whoops and shouts and words were heard in them go and dine at brimside good fellows go up to the toffs for supper and bed a christopher a christopher and so forth now all king christopher's men were afoot saving a band of the riders of brimside who bestrode strong and tall horses and bore jack and sallet and spear but no heavy armour so christopher heard and saw and the heart rose high in him and he sent messengers to the right and the left and bade the captains watch till he waved his sword aloft and then all down the bent together and he bade the brimside riders edge a little outward and downward and be ready for the chase and suffer not any of the foemen to gather together when once they fell to running for he knew in his heart that the folk before him would never abide their onfall and the day was yet young and it lacked four hours of noon king christopher abode ill he saw the foemen were come off the level ground and were mounting the bent slowly and not in very good order or in ranks closely serried then he strode forth three paces and waved his sword high above his head and cried out a christopher a christopher forward banner of the realm and forth he went steady and strong and a great shout arose behind him and none shrank or lagged but spears and bills and axes and swords all came on like a wall of steel so that to the foemen the earth seemed alive with death and they made no show of abiding the onset but all turned and ran save walter the white and a score of his knights who forsooth were borne down in a trice and were taken to mercy those of them who were not slain at the first crash of weapons there then ye might have seen great clumps of men making no defence but casting down their weapons and crying mercy and forsooth so great was the throng that no great many were slain but on the other hand but few gat away across the water and on them presently fell the brimside riders and hewed down and slew and took few to mercy and some few besides the first laggards of the bowmen it might be three hundreds in all escaped and gat to woodwall but when they of the town saw them they made up their minds speedily and shut their gates and the poor fleers found but the points of shafts and the heads of quarrels before them but on the field of deed those captives were somewhat fearful as to what should be done with them and they spake one to the other about it that they would be willing to serve the new king since he was so mighty and amidst of their talk came the captains of king christopher and they drew into a ring around them and the lords bade them look to it whether they would be foemen of the king the son of that king christopher the old if so ye be said they ye may escape this time but ye see how valiant a man he is and how lucky withal and happy shall they be whom he calleth friends now what say ye will ye take up your weapons again and be under the best of kings and a true one or will ye depart and take the chance of his wrath in the coming days we say how many of you will serve king christopher then arose from them a mighty shout all all one and all albeit some there were who slunk away and said naught and none heeded them so then all the sergeants and the common folk swore allegiance to king christopher but of the knights who were left alive some said yea and some nay and these last were suffered to depart but must needs ride unarmed now by the time all was done and the new men had dined along with the rest of the host and of the newcomers tale had been taken the day was wearing 
so they set off for woodwall and on the way they met the mayor and alderman thereof who came before king christopher and knelt to him and gave him the keys of their town so he was gracious to them and thanked them and bade see to the victual and lodging of the host and that all should be paid thereafter and they said that they had seen to all this before they came forth of the town and that if the lord king would ride forth he would find fair lodging in the good town so king christopher was pleased and bade the burgesses ride beside him and he talked merrily with them on the way so that their hearts rejoiced over the kindness of their lord so they came to the gate and there the king made stay till goldilind was fetched to him so that they might ride into the good town side by side and in the streets was much people thronging and the sun was scarce set so that the folk could see their king and queen what they were and they who were nighest unto them they let their shouts die out so were their hearts touched with the sight of them and the love of their beauty thus rode they in triumph through the street till they were come to their lodging which was great and goodly as for a cheaping town and so the day was gone and the night was come and the council and the banquet were over then were the king and goldilin together again like any up-country lad and lass but she stood before him and said o oh, thou king and mighty warrior surely i ought to fear thee now but it is not so so sore as i desire thee but yet it maketh both laughter and tears come to me when i think of the day we rode away from green harbour with thee and i seem to myself a great lady though i were unhappy and though i loved thy body i feared lest the churl's blood in thee might shame me perchance and i was proud and unkind to thee and i hurt thee sorely and now i will say it and confess that somewhat i joyed to see thine anguish for i knew that it meant thy love for me and thy desire to me lo now wilt thou forgive me this or wilt thou punish me o lord king he laughed sweetling he said meseemeth now all day long i have been fighting against raiment rather than men no man withstood me in the battle for that they feared the crown on my helm and the banner over my head and when these good men of the town brought me the keys how should i have known them from the borrel folk but for their scarlet gowns and fur hoods and meseemeth that when they knelt to me it was the scarlet gowns kneeling to the kingly armour therefore sweetheart if thou fearest that the king should punish thee for so wounding the poor christopher of those few days ago as belike thou deservest it bid the king do off his raiment and do thou in likewise and then there shall be no king to punish and no king scather to thole the punishment but only christopher and goldilind even as they met erewhile on the dewy grass of little dale she blushed blood red but ere his words were done her hands were busy with girdle and clasp and her raiment fell from her to the earth and his kingly raiment was cast from him and he took her by the hand and led her to the bed of honour that their love might have increase that night also chapter thirty five an old acquaintance and an evil deed when morning was and it was yet early the town was all astir and the gates were thrown open and weaponed men thronged into it crying out for christopher the king then the king came forth and jack of the tofts and his sons and oliver marson and the captains of brimside and the host was blown together to the market-place and there was a new tale of them taken and they were now hard on seventy hundreds of men so then were new captains appointed and thereafter they tarried not save to eat a morsel but went out a gate faring after the banners to oaken realm all folk blessing them as they went nought befell them of evil that day but ever fresh companies joined them on the road and they gat harbour in another walled town hight sevenham and rested there in peace that night and were now grown to eighty hundreds again on the morrow they were on the road betimes and again much folk joined them and they heard no tidings of any foeman faring against them whereat jack of the toffs marvelled for he and the others had deemed that now at last would rolf the traitor come out against them forsooth when they had gone all day and night was at hand it seemed most like to the captains that he would fall upon them that night 
whereas they were now in a somewhat perilous pass, for they must needs rest at a little thorp amidst of great and thick woods, which lay all around about the frank of Oakenham as a garland about a head. So there they kept watch and ward more heedfully than their wont was, and King Christopher lodged with Goldilind at the house of a good man of the thorp. Now when it lacked but half an hour of midnight, and Jack of the Tofts and Oliver Marson and the captain of Woodwall had just left him, after they had settled the order of the next day's journey, and Goldilind lay abed in the inner chamber, there entered one of the men of the watch, and said, Lord King, here is a man here by who would see thee. He is weaponed, and he saith that he hath a gift for thee. What shall we do with him? Said Christopher, Bring him hither, good fellow. And the man went back, and came in again, leading a tall man, armed, but with a hood done over his steel hat, so that his face was hidden, and he had a bag in his hand with something therein. Then spake the king, and said, Thou man, since thy face is hidden, this trusty man-at-arms shall stand by thee while we talk together. Lord, said the man, let there be a dozen to hear our talk, I care not, for I tell thee that I come to give thee a gift, and gift-bearers are oftenest welcome. Quoth the king, Maybe, yet before thou bring it forth I would see thy face, for me seems I have an inkling of thy voice. So the man cast back his hood, and lo, it was Simon the squire. Ha! said Christopher, is it thou then? Hast thou another knife to give me? Nay, said Simon, only the work of the knife. And therewith he set his hand to the bag, and drew out by the hair a man's head, newly hacked off and bleeding, and said, Hast thou seen him before, Lord? He was a great man yesterday, though not so great as thou shalt be to-morrow. Once only I have seen him, said Christopher, and then he gave me this gift, and he showed his father's ring on his finger. Thou hast slain the Earl Marshal who called himself the King of Oakenrealm. My traitor and dastard he was, but thy friend. Wherefore have I two evil deeds to reward thee, Simon, the wounding of me and the slaying of him? Dost thou not deem thee gallows ripe? King, said Simon, what wouldst thou have done with him, hast thou caught him? Said Christopher, I had slain him had I met him with a weapon in his fist, and if we had taken him, I had let the folk judge him said Simon. That is to say, that either thou hadst slain him thyself, or bidden others to slay him. Now then I ask thee, king, for which deed wilt thou slay me, for not slaying thee, or for doing thy work and slaying thy foe? said Christopher to the guard. Good fellow, fetch here a good horse, ready saddled and bridled, and be speedy. So the man went, and Christopher said to Simon, For the knife in my side I forgive it thee, and as to the slaying of thy friend, it is not for me to take up the feud, but this is no place for thee. If Jack of the Tofts, or any of his sons, or one of the captains findeth thee, soon art thou sped. Wherefore I read thee, when yonder lad hath brought thee the horse, show me the breadth of thy back, and mount the beast, and put the most miles thou canst betwixt me and my folk, for they love me. Said Simon, Sorry payments for making thee a king, said Christopher. Well, thou art in the right, I may well give gold for getting rid of such as thou. And he put his hand into a pouch that hung on his chair, and drew out thence a purse, and gave it on to Simon, who took it and opened it and looked therein, and then flung it down on the ground. Christopher looked on him wrathfully, with reddened face, and cried out, Thou dog! Wouldst thou be an earl and rule the folk? What more dost thou want? This! cried out Simon, and leapt upon him knife aloft. Christopher was unarmed utterly, but he caught hold of the felon's right arm with his right hand, and gripped the wrist till he shrieked. Then he raised up his mighty left hand, and drave it down on Simon's head by the ear, and all gave way before it, and the murderer fell crushed and dead to earth. Therewith came in the man-at-arms to tell him that the horse was come, but stared wild when he saw the dead man on the ground. But Christopher said, My lad, here hath been one who would have thrust a knife into an unarmed man, wherefore I must needs give him his wages. But now thou hast this to do. Take thou this dead man, and bind him so fast on the horse thou hast brought, that he will not come off till the bindings be undone. And bind with all the head of this other, who was once a great man and an evil, 
before the slayer of him, so that it also may be fast. Then get thee to horse, and lead this beast and its burden, till ye are well on the highway to Oakenham, and then let him go, and find his way to the gate of the city, if God will. And hearken, my lad, seest thou this gold which lieth scattering on the floor here? This was mine, but it is no longer, since I have given it away to the dead man just before he lifted his hand against me. Wherefore now I will keep it for thee, against thou comest back safe to me in the morning betimes, as I deem thou wilt, if thou wilt be height to St. Julian, the helping of some poor body on the road. Go therefore, but send hither the guard, for I am weary now, and would go to sleep without slaying any man else. So departed the man full of joy, and Christopher gathered his money together again, and so fared to his bed peacefully. End of part nine. Part ten of Child Christopher and Goldilin the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six. King Christopher comes to Oakenham. But on the morrow the first man who came to the king was the man-at-arms aforesaid, and he told that he had done the king's errand, and ridden a five miles on the road to Oakenham, before he had left the horse with his felon load, and that he had found naught stirring all that way when he had passed through their own outguards, where folk knew him and let him go freely. And, quoth he, it is like enough that this gift to Oakenham, Lord King, has by now come to the gate thereof, then the king gave that man the gold which he had promised, and he kissed the king's hand, and went his ways a happy man. Thereafter sent Christopher for Jack of the Toffs, and told him in few words what had betid, and that Rolf the traitor was dead. Then spake Jack, King and fosterling, never hath so mighty a warrior as thou waged so easy a war, for so goodly a kingdom as thou hast done, for surely thy war was ended last night. Wherefore will we straight to Oakenham, if so thou wilt? But if it be thy pleasure, I will send a chosen band of riders to wend on the spur thereto, and bid them get ready thy kingly house, and give word to the barons and prelates, and the chiefs of the knighthood, and the mayor and the aldermen, and the masters of the crafts, to show themselves of what mind they be towards thee. But I doubt it not that they will deem of thee as thy father come back again, and grown young once more. Now was Christopher eager, well nigh unto weeping, to behold his people, that he should live amongst. And gladly he yea said the word of Jack of the Tofts. So were those riders sent forward, and the host was ordered, and Christopher rode amidst it, with Goldilind by his side, and the sun was not yet gone down when they came within sight of the gate of Oakenham. And there before the gate, and in the fields on either side of it, was gathered a very great and goodly throng, and there went forth from it to meet the king, the bishop of Oakenham, and the abbot of St. Mary's, and the priors of the other houses of religion, all fairly clad in broidered copes, with the clerks and the monks dight full solemnly. And they came singing to meet him, and the bishop blessed him and gave him the hallowed bread, and the king greeted him and craved his prayers. Then came the Burgreave of Oakenham, and with him the barons and the knights, and they knelt before him, and named him to king, and the Burgreave gave him the keys of the city. Thereafter came the mayor and the aldermen, and the masters of the crafts, and they craved his favour, and warding of his mighty sword. And all these he greeted kindly and meekly, rather as a friend than as a great lord. Thereafter were the gates opened, and King Christopher entered, and there was no gainsaying, and none spake a word of the traitor Rolf. But the bells of the minster and of all the churches rang merrily, and songs were sung sweetly by fair women gloriously clad. And whereas King Christopher and Queen Goldilind had lighted down from their horses, and went afoot through the street, roses and all kinds of sweet flowers were cast down before the feet of them, all the way from the city gate to the king's high house of Oakenham. There then, in the great hall of his father's house, stood Christopher the king on the dais, and Goldilind beside him. And Jack of the Tofts, and the chiefest of the captains, and the bishop, and the greatest lords of the barons, 
and the doughtiest of the knights and the mayor and the aldermen and the masters of the crafts sat at the banquet with the king and his mate they break bread together and drank cups of renown till the void e cup was borne in then at last were the king and queen brought to their chamber with string play and songs and all kinds of triumph and that first night since he lay in his mother's womb did child christopher fall asleep in the house which the fathers had builded for him chapter thirty seven of child christopher's dealings with his friends and his folk it was in the morning when king christopher arose and Goldilin stood before him in the kingly chamber, that he clipped her and kissed her, and said, This is the very chamber whence my father departed, when he went to his last battle, and left my mother sickening with the coming birth of me. And never came he back hither, nor did mine eyes behold him ever. Here also lay my mother, and gave birth to me, and died of sorrow, and her also I never saw, save with eyes that noted naught that I might remember and my third kinsman was the traitor that cast me forth of mine heritage and looked to it that i should wax up as a churl and lose all hope of high deeds and at the last he strove to slay me therefore sweet have i no kindred and none that are bound to cherish me and it is for thee to take the place of them and be unto me both father and mother and brother and sister and all kindred she said my mother i never saw and i was but little when my father died and if i had any kindred thereafter they loved me not well enough to strike one stroke for me nay or to speak a word even when i was thrust out of my place and delivered over to the hands of pitiless people and my captivity worsened on me as the years grew wherefore to me also art thou in the stead of all kindred and affinity now christopher took counsel with jack of the toffs and the great men of the kingdom and that same day the first day of his kingship in oakenham was summoned a great moat of the whole folk and in half a month was it holden and thereat was christopher taken to king with none gainsaying began now fair life for the people of oakenrealm for jack of the toffs abode about the king in oakenham and wise was his counsel and there was no greed in him and yet he wotted of greed and guile in others and warned the king thereof when he saw it and the tyrants were brought low and no poor and simple man had need to thieve as for christopher he loved better to give than to take and the grief and sorrow of folk irked him sorely it was to him as if he had gotten a wound when he saw so much as one unhappy face in a day and all folk loved him and the fame of him went abroad through the lands and the roads of travel so that many were the wise and valiant folk that left their own land and came into oakenrealm to dwell there because of the good peace and the kindliness that there did abound so that oakenrealm became both many peopled and joyous though jack of the tofts abode with the king at oakenham his sons went back to the tofts and gilbert was deemed the head man of them folk gathered to them there and the wilderness about them became builded in many places and the toffs grew into a goodly cheaping town for those brethren looked to it that all roads in the woodland should be safe and at peace so that no chapman needed to arm him or his folk nay a maiden might go to and fro on the woodland ways with a golden girdle about her without so much as the crumpling of a lap of her gown unless by her own will as to david at first christopher bade him strongly to abide with him ever for he loved him much but david nay said it and would go home to the toffs and when the king pressed him sore at last he said friend and fellow i must now tell thee the very sooth and then shalt thou suffer me to depart though the sundering be but sorrow to me for this it is that i love thy lady and wife more than meat is and here i find it hard to thole my desire and my grief but down in the thicket yonder amongst my brethren of the woods and man and maid and wife and babe nay the very deer of the forest i shall become a man again and be no more a peevish and grudging fool and as the years wear shall sorrow wear and then who knows but we may come together again then christopher smiled kindly on him and embraced him but they spake no more of that matter but sat talking a while 
and then bade each other farewell and david went his ways to the tofts but a few months thereafter when a son had been born to christopher david came to oakenrealm but stayed there no longer than to greet the king and do him to wit that he was bound for oversea to seek adventure many gifts the king gave him and they sundered in all loving kindness and the king said farewell friend i shall remember thee and thy kindness for ever but david said by the roof in little dale and by the hearth thereof thou shalt be ever in my mind thus they parted for that time but five and twenty years afterwards when child christopher was in his most might and majesty and goldilind was yet alive and lovely and sons and daughters sat about their board it was the yule feast in the king's hall at oakenham and there came a man into the hall that none knew big of stature grey-eyed and hollow-cheeked with red hair grizzled and worn with the helm a weaponed man chieftain-like and warrior-like and when the serving-men asked him of his name and whence and whither he said i have come from overseas to look upon the king and when he seeth me he will know my name then he put them all aside and would not be gainsaid but strode up to the hall to the high seat and stood before the king and said hail little king christopher hail stout babe of the woodland then the king looked on him and knew him at once and stood up at once with a glad cry and came round unto him and took his arms about him and kissed him and led him into the high seat and set him betwixt him and goldilind and she also greeted him and took him by the hand and kissed him and jack of the tofts now a very old man but yet hale and stark who sat on the left hand of the king leaned toward him and kissed him and blessed him for lo it was david of the tofts spake he now and said christopher this is now a happy day said the king david whither away hence and what is thine heart set upon on the renewal of our youth said david and the abiding with thee but my will no further will i go than this thine house how sayest thou as thou dost said christopher that this is indeed a happy day drink out of my cup now to our abiding together and the end of sundering till the last cometh so they drank together they two and were happy amidst the folk of the hall and at last the king stood up and spake aloud and did all to wit that this was his friend and fellow of the old days and he told of his doughty deeds whereof he had heard many a tale and treasured them in his heart while they were apart and he bade men honour him all such as would be his friends and all men rejoiced at the coming of this doughty man and the friend of the king so there abode david holden in all honour and in great love of child christopher and goldilind and when his father died his earldom did the king give to david his friend who never sundered from him again but was with him in peace and in war in joy and in sorrow chapter thirty eight of matters of meadham goes the tale back now to the time when the kingship of child christopher was scarce more than one month old and tells that as the king sat with his queen in the cool of his garden on a morning of august there came to him a swain of service who did him to wit that an outland lord was come and would see him and give him a message so the king bade bring him into the garden to him straightway so the man went and came back again leading in a knight somewhat stricken in years on whose green surcoat was beaten a golden lion he came to those twain and did obeisance to them but spake as it seemed to goldilind alone lady and queen of meadham said he it is unto thee first of all that mine errand is then she spoke and said welcome to thee sir castellan of green harbour we shall hear thy words gladly said the newcomer lady i am no longer the burgreave of green harbour but sir geisbert lord of the green march and thy true servant and a suitor for thy grace and pardon i pardon thee not but thank thee for what thou didst of good to me said goldilind and i think that now thine errand shall be friendly then turned the green knight to the king and he said have i leave to speak lord king 
and he smiled covertly but christopher looked on the face and coat armour of him and called him to mind as the man who had stood betwixt him and present death that morning in the porch of the little dale house so he looked on him friendly and said my leave thou hast to night to speak fully and freely and that the more as me seemeth i saw thee first when thou hadst weaponed men at thy back and wert turning their staves away from my breast even so it is lord king said the knight and to say sooth i fear thee less for thy kingship than because i wot well that thou mayst lightly take me up by the small of my back and cast me over thy shoulder if thou have a mind therefore christopher laughed at his word and bade him sit down upon the green grass and tell his errand straightway and the knight tarried not but spake out queen of Meadham, i am a friend and fellow and in some sort a servant to earl geoffrey regent of Meadham, whom thou knowest and he hath put a word in my mouth which is both short and easy for me to tell all goes awry in Meadham now and men are arming against each other and will presently be warring but if thou look to it because all this is for lack of thee but if thou wilt vouchsafe to come to Meadhamstead and sit on thy throne for a little while commanding and forbidding and if thou wilt appoint one of the lords for thine earl there and others for thy captains and governors and burgreaves and so forth then if the people see thee and hear thee the swords will go into their sheaths and the spears will hang on the wall again and we shall have peace in Meadham, for all will do thy bidding wherefore lady and queen i beseech thee to come to us and stave off the riot and ruin what sayest thou goldilind made answer in a while sir guys but true it is that i long to see my people and to look once more on my father's house and the place where he was born and died but how know i but this is some while of earl geoffrey for he hath not been abounding in trustiness toward us but sir guysbert swore on his salvation that there was no guile therein and they were undone save goldilind came on to them then spake christopher sir knight i am willing to pleasure my lady who as i can see longeth to behold her own land and people and also by thy voice and thy face i deem that thou art not lying unto me and that no harm will befall the lady yet will i ask thee right out what thou and thy lord would think thereof if she come into Meadham accompanied to wit if i rode with her and had five hundreds of good riders at my back would ye have guesting for so many and such stark lads the knight took up the word eagerly and said wilt thou but come dear lord and bring a thousand or more then the surer and the safer it would be for us said the king smiling well it shall be thought on and meantime be thou merry with us for indeed i deem of thee that but for thy helping my life had been cast away that morning in little dale so they made much of the Meadham man for three days and thereafter they rode into Meadham and to Meadhamstead, christopher and jack of the tofts and goldilind in all honour and triumph they and seven hundreds of spears and never were lords received with such joy and kindness as were they but it were on the day when christopher and his entered oakenham the earl geoffrey was not amongst them that met them but when as they sat at the banquet in the hall and goldilind was in the high seat gloriously clad and with the kingly crown on her head there came a tall man up to the dais grey-headed and keen-eyed and he was unarmed without so much as a sword by his side and clad in simple black and he knelt before goldilind and laid his head on her lap and spake lady and queen here is my head to do with as thou wilt for i have been thy dastard and i crave thy pardon if so it may be for i am geoffrey she looked kindly on him and raised him up and then she turned to the chief of the serving men and said fetch me a sword with its sheath and its girdle and see that it be a good blade and all well adorned both sword and sheath and girdle even so it was done and when she had the sword she bade sir geoffrey kneel again before her and she girt him with the said sword and spake sir geoffrey all the wrong which thou didst to me i forgive it thee and forget it but wherein thou hast done well i will remember it for thou hast given me a mighty king to be my man nay 
the mightiest and the loveliest on earth wherefore i bless thee and will make thee my earl to rule all medom under me if so be the folk gainsay it not wherefore now let these folk fetch thee seemly garments and array thee and then come sit amongst us and eat and drink on this high day for a happy day it is when once again i sit in my father's house and see the faces of my folk that loveth me she spake loud and clear so that most folk in the hall heard her and they rejoiced at her words for sir geoffrey was no ill ruler but wise and of great understanding keen of wit and deft of word and a mighty warrior withal only they might not away with it that their lady and queen had become as alien to them so when they heard her speak her will they shouted for joy of the peace and good will that was to be there then sat geoffrey at the banquet and christopher smiled on him and said see now lord if i have not done as thou badest when thou gavest me the treasure of green harbour for i have brought the wolf heads to thy helping and not to thy scathing do thou as much for me and be thou a good earl to thy lady and mine and then shalt thou yet live and die a happy man and my friend or else there shall be no else lord king quoth geoffrey all men henceforth shall tell of me as a true man so they were blithe and joyous together but a seven days thence was the all men's moat gathered to the woodside without Medhamstead, and thronged it was and there goldilin stood up before all the folk and named sir geoffrey for earl to rule the land under her and none gainsaid it for they knew him meet thereto then she named from the baronage and knighthood such men as she had been truly told were meet thereto to all the offices of the kingdom and there was none whom she named but was well pleasing to the folk for she had taken counsel beforehand with all the wisest men of all degrees as for herself all loved and worshipped her and this alone seemed hard on to them that she must needs go back to oakenrealm in a few days but when she heard the murmur thereat she behight them that once in every year she would come into Meadham and spend one whole month therein and were it possible ever should that be the month of may so when they heard that they all praised her and were the more content this custom she kept ever thereafter and she lay in with her second son in the city of Meadhamstead, so that he was born therein and she named him to be king after her to the great joy of that folk and he grew up strong and well liking and came to the kingship while his mother was yet alive and was a good man and well beloved of his folk before she turned back with her man she let seek out aloise and when she came before her gave her gifts and bade her come back with her to oakenham and serve her there if she would and the damsel was glad for there in Medhamstead was she poor and not well seen to whereas it was rumoured of her that she had been one of the jailers of goldilind when they came back to oakenham there they met gandolf baron of brimside now whole of his hurts and the king greeted him kindly and did well to him all his life and found him ever a true man good thenceforward was the life of child christopher and goldilind whiles indeed they happed on unpeace or other trouble but never did fair love and good worship depart from them either of each unto each or of the whole folk unto them twain to no man did christopher meet out worse than his deserts nay to most far better he meted no man he feared nor hated any save the tormentors of poor folk and but a little while abided his hatred of those for it cut short their lives so that they were speedily done with and forgotten and when he died a very old man but one year after goldilind his dear no king that ever lived was so bewailed by his folk as was child christopher end of part 10 end of child christopher and goldilind the fair by william morris read by phil benson